Hey everyone, welcome back. This time we're going to analyze the data set uh, that you've got. So we're going to import those into ImageJ. If you haven't imported um, images into ImageJ before, um, check out the another video that I'll put in, in the description um, for troubleshooting, because Astro ImageJ doesn't always get it right the first time. Uh, so I'm going to go to the folder that has our data in it, and I'm going to select the first image here in this whole data set, and just click Open. And then we've got our, this, this is, we went over this in a previous video, so just import that sequence. There you go. So here we go. We've got our data all ready to go. Looks pretty good. You can see that um, this transit started sh more closely after sunset than maybe any others would, because you can see that the background's a little bit lighter there, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, and the images, for the most part, are pretty stable which means the stars aren't moving around. So what we're going to do, what we want to do for this, first of all, we have to find our, our star that has the planet around it. And for that, we can look at the finder map. In my case, I've actually set this up and flipped it around so that it's the right orientation for what we're looking for. Um, if, if the finder map that you have isn't in that orientation, you may have to do some like rotating um, or flipping horizontally to get it right. In this case, I had to flip it vertically to get it right. So that's our little finder map. And if we look at our images, now you can see that there's a bright star here. And that's that bright star here. And then there's this little group of stars in the middle that we've got on ours as well. And this star here is the star that we're looking for. And you can zoom in a little bit closer on uh, this image to see in more detail if you'd like. But it's definitely this one here. So now that we know which star we're looking for, what we're going to do is something called multi-aperture, it's this button here, multi-aperture measurements. Um, so you're looking for, and, and you, your mouse, your cursor may not look like this, but you're looking for two little, these two little circles next to each other, these two little targets. So you're going to click on that, and just want, when you're doing this, you just want to make sure that the first slice says one, and the last slice, uh, that's at the very end. So that just means that it's going to process your whole data set, and not just like some smaller chunk of it. So you just want to make sure that it's this says one, and that is as far to the right as it can be. What we're doing when we're doing this um, with these little aperture, uh, these are the aperture measurements. So those are the little, the little rings that I've got on my cursor here. And what we're doing uh, when we're putting these in place is we're just asking the program to look within these little apertures and see how much the light changes. So you want the aperture to fit pretty tightly around the star that you're looking for, especially in this case when um, you have other stars nearby. So you can change these around a little bit. You can make them smaller or bigger. Um, and I'll, I'll just make this really big to prove a point. There you go. So that's what that would look like. But that's not what we want. So we'll go back and we'll make it suited to our stars. We're going to make that 5 and make these smaller by 2 each time. That's better. OK, so the very first aperture, these little targets that you place, will go on the star that you want to measure the brightness of, so the one that has the exoplanet around it. So you're going to left click and that's going to set your target star. After that, the way to check to see how the brightness is changing in that star is to compare it to other stars in the picture. So go around and find stars that are nice little stars, have nothing else around them, and keep left clicking on them, and that will select them as stars that you want to check with. So the star that we clicked on here is our, our target star. And these other stars that we're clicking on are check stars. So I've got four. I'm happy with that. You'll want to do more than three, um, but you don't have to do a ton, a ton. So once you've got those stars selected, right click. And as you right click, all these windows will pop up and measurements will start taking. It won't look like this because I've changed the settings. So I'm going to leave it to do this. This is, this is what it'll look like for you when it pops up. It'll analyze all these frames that you've given it. And as it does, um, this is essentially measuring the change in brightness, is, brightness of each of the pixels of the star that we're looking at. This little window is a nice one to keep an eye on, the multi-plot reference star settings window, because uh, it tells you with these green boxes whether or not the stars are um, quote-unquote normal, so whether or not they 
um, like if they if they suddenly vary by some huge amount of light, then it'll it'll show as a yellow border. Um, and then if it if it gets so bright that this program can't read the changes in brightness, it'll get a red checkbox. So if you get either of those, you shouldn't ever get a red checkbox. But if you get a yellow one, um, what you'll want to do is just close all these windows down except for this one. Um, and I'll I'll do this just to just to show you what would happen if if something like that were were to happen. Um, so let's say one of these is yellow. We're going to close all these down. Don't worry, we can get them get them all back later. And we're going to go back to our original our original frame. And this little thing has a little brush um, over the two apertures. So this is just clearing the apertures and annotations from the overlay. So you hit that little button, and then you try again. Uh, for now, I'm going to restart our process so that we can see it all happen again, and then we'll go and look at the data. OK, so we're back with our original data plot and what our, uh, our um, program originally gave us. And this is assuming that all of our check stars are good and our target star is good, everything's happy. So we have just this mountain of windows. This is our, our essential basic data uh, that has been spat out, so the change in the brightness of that star. But we can change and add lots of stuff to, to be able to sort of see that transit that we're looking for. And in this case, we do get, a bit, we do get that, that star brightness along here, and then it dips, and it comes back up again. So let's analyze it. Let's start off with this is the multiplot y data um, window. And in this one, uh, I'm, I'm going to add in the extra stars that we used as check stars just to make sure they look OK. So you can click all these little, there's a little plot thing here next to the different data sets. These are the different stars that you, that you added in. And you can see the check star one, or two, three, four, five, and six. Um, so I'm, I'm mm, we don't really need to use all of them. We won't use that one. So there's our, our check stars. Isn't that nice? Uh, the way that these appear, you can actually change where these appear on your chart if you want to by um, going over to the right-hand side of this multiplot y data window. Um, this is your, your main star, so don't mess with that one. But then you can change the scale and the up and down shift of each of these. So these are all looking like they're in nice little alignment spots, but green is pretty far away. So to fix that, here's green. This one's green. So I'm going to make this scale smaller. I'm going to make it more in line with the other stars. And I'm going to move it up. There we go. So now our chart looks a little bit nicer and a little bit tidier. Um, and everything's in line. This doesn't tell you the absolute value of the brightness. It just tells you the relative change. Um, so when it says over here, it's shifting things down and scaling them down, it's just changing the relationship of the points to one another. Awesome. OK, so we have all our data. That's great. Um, now we want to see how it compares to our hypothesis. So what we're going to do, I'm going to minimize some of these because we don't need them right now. We will need this eventually. Um, first, I'm going to bring up the multiplot main window. And don't worry if you get lost doing all this stuff. It's, it is a bit tricky to find all the windows. Um, so the multiplot main window has things like uh, you can change the title of your chart here. You can say no title if your teacher does not want you to have a title. Um, I include a title because otherwise I lose track of what I'm doing. Um, so I've included the title, and you can include a legend if you want to as well. So here comes the hypothesizing time. So on your hypothesis data sheet, which I will, I'll just pull up uh, the one for happy 16 b here, um, we have all these extra numbers about the predicted time of the transit. If you look at the chart, you'll notice that this is in geocentric Julian date which is a weird time, way to measure time. It just basically means that they've taken a day uh, and given it a value of one. And then as the time passes through the day, it goes from zero to one. And then the day ticks over and we get a new day. So you can see here that I've included that the UTC date that we're doing this is 8,780. Um, that's just the number that's going to come before a lot of what we're looking at. And then if you look at the Julian date, we have our numbers for ingress and egress, which is when the planet comes into the star's disk and when it leaves the star's disk. You'll notice that this is, um, this actually gives the universal, or sorry, the um, UTC and Julian date number beforehand. I've written 8780. This is 240, sorry, 2,458,780. Uh, 
when they chose Julian dates, they just started on a specific date and they counted up from there. Um, and so oftentimes people will remove the 2000, 245 at the beginning, the 2,450,000, and just use the last four uh, digits to keep track of the date. And that's what I've done here. So we have our UTC 8780, and we have the ingress at UTC 8780.6409. So um, we can go over here and look at the vertical markers. There are these little vertical markers that you can put in. Uh, and I've added in labels here. So this says predicted ingress, which means per time that it's going to come in, predicted egress, okie dokie, um, for the markers. And you can add in the point on this time scale where you expect it to be. Um, so this is at 0 0.6409 as per our, and, uh, switch over to the sheet, as per here, 6409. And then the egress is 0 0.7684, 0 0.7684. And hit the little check marks. And with those little check marks, we'll be able to see our predicted ingress and egress of the planet. All well and good. Now we want to actually see what the data says. And so that means maybe adding a trend line. And to add a trend line, we're going to go back to our multiplot y data for, uh, window. And we're going to go to a fit mode on our first star. And this may be hard to see. Um, it's got a little bar with a dip and then another bar along the side. So that's the, the um, expected transit of a, of a planet in front of its star. So we're going to click the last option on fit mode for the star that we want. Great big thing comes up with all sorts of information in it. Um, you can learn a lot from this, and you can take some time looking around here and figuring out what kind of stuff is in here. But the main thing I want you to do while you're in here is change this. This is the period of the star, so how, how long it takes to go around, sorry, the period of the planet, so how long it takes to go around its star. And that we can find from our hypothesis sheet. This one's 2.78 days. Once again, I have already made that change to 2.78 days. Uh, and then we've got, oh no, this is all extra information about um, different parameters. This may be unchecked, but just make sure that you check it uh, once uh, as locked if it's having a, a bit of a, a bit of trouble with it. So what you'll notice once it's added this trend line is that that's not looking too good. Now we know that there was a transit because other people had taken images of the planet and they calculated that this was when the, the planet would be transiting. So if something like this happens, what I recommend is, again, canceling out all of everything, including your chart that you have so far, going back, taking a look at your um, the targets, the little apertures that you have. So we do still have a star in here. So let's try to make these apertures smaller, and let's see if we get better, better data from that. So maybe this time we'll try, five was pretty good, but let's try eight, seven. Now let's try seven and... 10. How does that look? That looks better. So let's give that a try and we'll come back and see what we've got. Okay, so the nice thing about doing this all over again is that it at least it remembers your settings. Um, so it brings up all the extra check stars, it brings up the, the predicted ingress and egress again, so all good there. Um, let's, it, if you had the trend line, trend line on, it will also have brought that up, but I turned it off because I was finding it irritating um, as it was updating. And this time, having tightened up the apertures a bit more, it looks a lot better. Um, so we can see that it's actually a little bit earlier than our predicted ingress and egress. So this came, the predicted ingress is actually a, yeah, a good chunk earlier than the predicted, or the actual ingress is a good chunk earlier than the predicted ingress, and the actual egress is a good chunk earlier than the uh, predicted egress. So looking closer at the trend line, um, we've adjusted to say that the period is 2.78 days. Um, and you can lock this in or not. In this case, actually, it looks pretty good if you don't lock it in. So let's not lock it in this time. And there's some cool stuff that you can learn from this. So if you, uh, first of all, if you want to save this, save this for later, you can go file and save image of fit panel. Um, I wouldn't really worry about saving this as a text file, but it might help you remember what the numbers are. Um, so these are really hard to understand, but if you keep them here and if you've just, if you've just analyzed it, um, you can figure out this is uh, like what angle the planet's coming in. That may not be very accurate, and, and we don't have a an, um, we don't have a hypothesis for that. But what we do have a hypothesis for is how long the transit was supposed to be. So this one um, is the duration of transit in hours, minutes, and seconds. Uh, and if you hover over it, it will tell you that 
There we go. It's the full duration of the transit from as soon as the planet starts to hit the star to as soon as the planet leaves the star, three hours and eight minutes. Uh, and if we look back at our hypothesis sheet, that's actually pretty close. Our hypothesis was that it was gonna be three hours and four minutes. So a four minute difference is really pretty small. Um, that could be from things like atmosphere shimmering or maybe our, our apertures still aren't tight enough, uh, but still, I'd say that's pretty good. Good for us. Uh, so that's probably the biggest one that you're gonna wanna be interested in. Just a couple little extra things. Uh, if, you, if your plot line doesn't show up immediately, just make sure to click this button that says show model. Um, or show in legend if you want to add in this little line up here. And you can change the color so that it stands out uh, or fits in depending on what you prefer. So that gives us lots of extra information about the transit. It gives you an idea of how, how well we managed to plot it. And in this case, it looks like we, got, we did a pretty good job. I'll give you one last tip as well. Um, sometimes what happens automatically is that you'll get this really massive, long um, legend like this. It'll tell you what each individual star is. If you don't want to include all that information, um, it does include the information like how much you scaled it and, and stuff like that. So that's really nice. But if you don't want to include that, you can just go over to the Multiplot Y Data window and tell the legend that you don't want it. So you just close out everything. So there you go. This will still tell you the difference between the dots and the line itself. Finally, to save this so that you can uh, use it later, you could click Save, and then you can add it in as your chart or what have you, and uh, in this case, I'll say at P 16B um, transit plot. And I'll save that for use later, just in case. You can, again, you can do the same with a couple other op, a couple other windows. One of the windows that you can save if you really, really want uh, lots and lots of data is this. This is, you can uh, open up in Excel. It tells you everything that it has figured out about the transit. So you've got the file names, you've got what number in, the, in line they are, you have the date in that Julian time that I had mentioned. Uh, you have it in like the full thing with the 22.4 million in front of it. Um, you can, there's, there's so much information here that, that you really don't need it. You have the temperature that the sensor was at, at the time that we were taking the pictures. Uh, there's a lot of extra information, but it does give you the values for the relative flux. So the change, the relative change in the, in the brightness of the star, um, for your target star, for your check stars, um, and then the error on each of those. So it gives you a lot of extra information, which you can then use, um, and play with in Excel if you want to make more, uh, charts with that. So that's it. After that, uh, you'll want to write up all your um, results and talk about how they compare to what you expected uh, and why they might be different. Thanks everybody for following along. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me. My email will be in the description of the video and have fun with your processing.